After days of traveling through dense and dangerous woods, populated with hostile creatures and dangerous magics trying to put you down, you finally arrived at your destination, the dungeon. A gargantuan underground structure of old. Its purpose? To have some enemies to beat up inside. Its reason to exist? To be plundered and looted. The reason for its unusual placement? So it's harder to get a long rest when exhausted? Dungeons are a staple of pen and paper role-playing games since the conception of pen and paper role-playing games. The former war games, where you started out leading armies, got reduced to a single person you are controlling, your character. You are navigating through the encounters your game master throws at you, acting on the decisions your character would take, adding the role-playing element. Dungeons are such a staple that the most well-known pen and paper game has dungeons in the name. I hope I won't get sued by wizards in the future for mentioning them without giving them my revenue of half a cent or whatever. Even outside of pen and paper games, the concept of dungeons is a staple of fantasy and pulp fiction. During the 19th century craze of gothic and historical novels, dungeons were still the classic obliete beneath the castle, where the villains kept and tortured their captives. Modern fiction and of course pen and paper games coined the term in a different light. The temples Indiana Jones must navigate through were being chased by Nazis, or the Mines of Moria in Lord of the Rings are well-known examples. The best of the most well-known examples are Conan the Barbarian's Adventures, I'd say. It hits the best sweet spot of the original fantasy and pulp fiction definition of a dungeon, of a labyrinthine complex with enemies, MacGuffins, and loot to find. In today's pen and paper games, a dungeon is not what it once was anymore. Today, a dungeon is whatever structure your players navigate through, where rewards and enemies might await them. It doesn't have to be ancient or labyrinthine. A local criminal's hideout in the city can be a dungeon, but this video isn't about it. This video is distinctively about the classical sense of what the dungeon is. An old structure, no matter if forgotten or not. Something to explore, something with riches or answers to questions. And most importantly, with enemies inside or puzzles to solve. But uh, this video isn't about how to design a dungeon in the gameplay sense. There are countless of videos doing a better job than I, I ever could. I'd recommend the video made by Matt Coville. This video is about the world building of a dungeon, about the purpose and reason to exist, how they fit in your world, since thinking about the world building first will make your dungeon turn out way better anyway. Let's talk about the purpose of dungeons then. The most important question to ask yourself, like always, in the past of pen and paper games, and even in current old school renaissance systems, dungeons were nothing more than a place to get loot at and beat up enemies that were evil and to beat up just because and without any reason behind it. You can do better than that. So what is your dungeon there for? Why does it exist? Who built it? What was its original purpose or its current purpose or state, if it's just a set of ruins? What does the surrounding population know of the dungeon? How do you enter the dungeon? Just as a side note, if your setting is more on the cliché side of fantasy, which can be fun if done right, I really want to see something akin to a state-sanctioned dungeon, where the state has control over some dungeon and people flock there, pay an entry fee, and are allowed to gain power and treasures or whatever. I think I've only seen that in anime, which utilize these cliches the most anyway. So what awaits people as a reward when entering and beating the dungeon? Is it a classic pulp fiction style dungeon, like an old king's grave, where you are getting tons of riches of it? Maybe some legendary items await you, which could just be items for your players to get more powerful or, more interestingly, a MacGuffin to stop the bad guys of your campaign. Or even more interesting, answers, lore, some tidbits that might explain 
parts of the ancient history of your world and even answers that are somewhat in relation to your campaign story. Your players will be way more interested in being told how the plans of your current campaign villain has been foiled in the past over some unrelated lore. The mixture of how much of each to be expected depends on your group of course. Information would be enough for me, but others need some more monetary rewards to be content with what they got in dungeons. Oh, and don't forget that some people might not be content with grave robbing. So who protects these treasures? MacGuffins or the information? What lurks inside the dungeon? Who lives there and why? What are the puzzles that are part of the defensives? There are two ways to answer this question, or three. The dungeon may have next to no original defensive systems anymore. Instead, it's populated by another menace. A set of kobolds, goblins, undead, bandits, or maybe another nuisance populates the dungeon as their home, sitting on whatever your players are after. Give these nuisances a reason why they are there and why they haven't been removed yet. Don't make them into a standard evil to just cull down. If they just live there in peace, diplomacy may be a more efficient way to get through than aggression. If it's a defensive system, think about the power level of it. Especially uh, with ancient dungeons. It's better when it has a power leakage or something akin, so it is possible for a low level party to get through. Especially fun with golems and other constructs. Put these in relation to those who build them. Try to convey the lore of the past through enemies and puzzles. A mixture of both types of obstacles would be the third answer. The lower levels not being opened by any of the creatures populating the upper levels yet. Lastly, we think about characters associated with the dungeon. This is quite a diverse set of possibilities. Think either about a guardian who protects the dungeon. It could be an inherited position, if it's some religious site, maybe some person in a nearby village. Or maybe it's a magical creature guarding it. Or something akin to an auditor who puts obstacles in the way of those who want to enter the treasure chambers. If your dungeon is populated by monsters and the like, think about their chief, their boss, some other important figure that keeps them together. Oh, and if it's a grave, think about the most important person buried there, of course. Maybe they might wander around as a ghost or something again. Always a fun trope. Our dungeon is within our region called Krom Spring. It's literally at the spring of the river Krom. The spring being deep within our dungeon. The first creek running along its length and turning into a river outside. Our dungeon is a vast complex carved into a mountain. The dungeon serves as the tomb for the ancient hero Theodoric, who fought in the wars against the giants. The tomb was built by his clan almost 2000 years ago. His clan being the people who turned into the Groms folk of today. Today it's a religious site for the Groms folk and many other people who worship heroes of old akin to local deities and magical beings. Pilgrimages are dangerous though, since the woods surrounding the river spring are dangerous and full of vicious fauna. The Andritz is locked and guarded by the fairy who protects the river spring called Giselle. She lets only those enter who she sees as worthy. Sacrifices may be enough to coax her at times. Maybe she wants you to do something for her or she just plays around with you. Fairies can be unpredictable at times, but for the sake of a hypothetical adventure, she'll probably ask you for a sacrifice of some monster to slay. Tying it to another adventure hook I talked about in the town's video. In the end she'll make sure that you don't corrupt either river nor the dungeon. If you do so, she'll kill you and eat your soul. In our hypothetical campaign, our players went to the region of Kroms Spring and to the town of Untergrombach to gather information. This information led them to the dungeon, since inside an important MacGuffin awaits them. There is an axe, Theodoric's great axe. With the axe you can banish certain creatures straight into the underworld and away from the material plane. The axe has seen its better days, making the ability only be usable for a couple of times. The axe is the only thing Giselle might you allow to take with you, however. But only if you told them your ambitions with the axe. So the reward would be the axe. 
and some additional cultural lore spread out here and there, which might answer some further questions regarding the villain of the campaign. Besides Giselle, they'll have to navigate through some ancient challenges. The good old trope of being worthy to enter. There will be a set of encounters, combat against golems and other ancient machinations. Ancient magics your players wouldn't even know about to the same extent anymore. The encounters could be all connected to a bigger puzzle perhaps. There are quite some interesting videos on how to make them, but when thinking about defenses, always remember the connection to those who built your dungeon. Make it distinct to the culture who built it. So let's talk a bit more about the fairy Giselle. Giselle was the protector, the nymph of the Groms River Spring, long before Theodoric's birth. She has a timid and shy personality, she doesn't talk much, but she's rather quick to anger in certain situations. She has a sister, Bavette, who's the protector of the Groms folk living downstream. Giselle is more or less the personification of the river's will. She doesn't communicate with the river, she rather is its mind and mouth. She feels the river's ailments and pains as much as she feels her own. She knows about the river's problems and whatever happens along its shores. Giselle is powerful. Nobody exactly knows how powerful. But she contains her power for the betterment and protection of the river's spring. And the protection of the tomb of Theodoric, the hero's grave. Theodoric knew the fairy since she was a child. He played at the river's spring, protected by Giselle's sister Bavette, and came around nearly every day. The shy and reclusive nymph opened up to him, played with him, later trained with him to become a warrior. They enjoyed their time together, for him years went by, while for Giselle it was just the spur of the moment. When Theodoric grew into a man, he had to go to war. The tribes were called together to defend the lands against the onslaught of the giants. Giselle decided to come with him. The first time Giselle ever left the river spring, and the first time she joined a war. They fought side by side for decades. They were part of the group that infiltrated the giant king's palace to kill the king. Later, Theodoric returned as a hero, and Giselle got recognized by the tribes and the entire population along the river's shores as the river goddess of the Groms River. But then again, time flew. Theodoric died of old age, leaving Giselle behind. Sad and in sorrow for having lost her friend, she could spend so little time with. She insisted for Theodoric to be buried right at the river's spring. Thanks for watching the video to the end. Tell me about your dungeons in your pen and paper games. Or how you'd build something akin to the idea of a dungeon into your world. See ya!